Hello again. In the next short section, I'm going to talk about stents, the history of stenting and the current market conditions. First of all, what is a stent? It's a type of wire mesh that fits within the artery and it helps to push plaque to the side of the artery and open up the artery again to allow blood to flow. So a stent is used when uh, somebody has occlusion of their artery, they might have plaque buildup and inevitably this is going to cause a heart attack when blood stops flowing due to occlusion of the artery. So the stent has been a, uh, it's been a game changer in, in coronary care and it, it certainly has saved uh, many, many lives. It's inserted during the PTCA procedure, which is um, percutaneous transluminary coronary art angioplasty, which I'll explain momentarily. Uh, so what happens is that the stent, uh, which is here, it, it's mounted onto a plastic balloon and there is a guide wire uh, which guides the, the whole structure through the artery up to the place where the occlusion has happened. Um, the balloon is then inflated and therefore the stent uh, takes its shape against the blood vessel wall. The, stent, the balloon then can be deflated and pulled back out of the artery and the stent stays open and keeps the plaque in place. And I'll post a video of this stenting procedure separately to this. There's two types of stents, there's bare metal stents and there's drug eluting stents. And these are the stents um, used in coronary care. There's many different types of stents uh, for other parts of the body. There's urethral stents and, and renal stents. But uh, for the purpose of this, we're going to talk about coronary stents, which are used to, to treat uh, blood vessels in the heart. So we'll have a brief history of stenting. So percutaneous transluminary coronary arch angioplasty was pioneered by Grunzig in 1977. And uh, as I said, this was, it was truly remarkable and it was a big game changer. So percutaneous is through the skin, transluminal, across the lumen of the coron coronary uh, artery. And, uh, and here's another simplistic animation. So we have a guide wire here that's pushing a deflated balloon to a place in the artery where plaque buildup has happened. The balloon is inflated, it pu pushes the plaque to the side and the balloon is deflated and removed. So uh, this was a game changer, but what happened was the wall of the coronary artery became weakened after balloon dilation. Uh, so there was a weakening here of the artery and sometimes when the balloon was pulled back the artery would collapse in on itself again and would lead to uh, occlusion and fatal uh, had fatal consequences and this happened in about 30 to 40 percent of cases a second problem also became evident so if a collapse didn't happen uh, in 30% of cases, arteries began to close up again shortly after balloon angioplasty. And uh, there was various devices pioneered, lasers, uh, tiny shavers to, to, to shave the plaque, rotational polishers to try and get rid of the plaque that way. And these were all experimented with tools were miniaturized to be able to be delivered by catheter to the artery site and the term keyhole surgery came into common usage. So it was a time where there was a lot of innovation in medical devices. One device that was pioneered at this time was the stent. And the stent, as we've seen, is a metal tube or a scaffold that inserts into the artery after balloon angioplasty. So the stent itself is mounted on a balloon and is opened when placed into the coronary artery. And uh, the, the stent that is credited would, would be one of the first to market is the Palmas and Schatz stent. Um, others in Europe were developing their own designs around the same time. Um, and as I said, it was a real time of innovation in stent designs. This is an example of the early Palmas Schatz stent design. So the first stenting procedure was performed in 1986 by Puel and Sigwart. Um, it prevented vessel closure during the 
angioplasty and it reduced the incidence of angiographic restenosis. So restenosis is regrowing of the plaque or the stenosis afterwards. Um, Despite the widespread use of these devices, bare metal stents have been associated with a 20 to 30 percent restenosis rate requiring reintervention. So it reduced the incidence, but it's still happening 20 to 25 percent at this point. Um, so what restenosis is? It refers to the growth of scar tissue within the stent, and this is because the blood vessel wall is injured during the stenting procedure. Um, due to the injury, smooth muscle cells, which uh, comprise the blood vessel wall, uh, start to proliferate to provide a scar and heal the damaged tissue. And this is a natural biological response to tissue being damaged. And what happens if this is a blood vessel? When you start to get these smooth muscle cells proliferating to form a scar, you get a scar formation on both sides. The blood flow now that should be flowing in a nice laminar uh, flow through the blood vessel uh, starts to become a little bit turbulent around here and bl red blood cells start to stick together and you start to get blood clotting and um, and you can get extra plaque formation. So you can get a blood clot. This might get dislodged. It might move upstream. Um, and you have a restenosis or reblocking of the artery. So while stents virtually eliminated many of the complications of abrupt artery closure, the, con the condition known as restenosis persisted. The rates were a little bit lower, um, but bare metal stents still experienced reblocking, typically at six month intervals in about 25% of all cases, thereby necessitating a repeat procedure. And then came the dawn of the drug eluting stents, and this happened in about 2001, 2002. These stents are also referred to as coated or medicated stents. And what they are is a normal metal stent that has been coated with a pharmacologic agent known to interfere with the process of restenosis. And the data gathered so far, uh, which is, is referenced here, um, the stent has been extremely successful in reducing restenosis from the 20 to 30 percent range to 5 to 10 percent. So drug illusion stents certainly have had an impact in reducing this rate of restenosis. There's three major components to a drug illusion stent. So there is number one, the type of stent that carries the drug coating. So the stent can be any number of metals or polymers more recently. The method by which the drug is delivered um, to the coating of the arterial wall. So the drug might be embedded in a polymer which is coated on the stent or it could be coated just to the stent to the bare metal itself. And the drug itself uh, is another component. How does this drug act in the body to prevent restenosis? There's several decisions to be made by the interventional cardiologist to ensure a successful placement. And sometimes these are um, referred to as being as important uh, or even more important than the type of stent and drug uh, that's chosen. So the stent must be correctly sized in terms of length to match the length of the lesion. Uh, the sizing of the diameter must be cre correct to match the thickness of the healthy part of the artery. And the stent must be sufficiently deployed, making sure the stent is placed at the optimum site in the blocked artery and is expanded fully to the arterial wall. So there's quite a bit of skill in determining the, the type, the length, the diameter of the stent, the type of stent that best matches that patient, and then the surgery itself. And they're all going to affect uh, the outcome of that patient and as to whether retinosis will occur again, uh, regardless of the, um, the materials and the drug that's there. Uh, so just have to have a, qu a quick recap on it. Um, so we have here a stent delivery catheter. So it's a plastic catheter, uh, a plastic tube essentially that has a balloon um, bonded to it. The guide wire um, 
goes up through the tube and it has these location markers on it and these are little gold bands so that you can visualize where the stent is during the procedure the radio peg the balloon inflates then uh, which is seen here uh, with a drug coated stent on it and here's another diagram here on the right that you can have a look at in your own time In terms of what's on the market, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but it, it rounds up, I suppose, the main players in the stent market, uh, mainly drug eluting stent. Uh, so from 2002-2003, um, we had uh, this Cypher stent uh, leading the charge. This was a 316L, which is a stainless steel stent, and the drug coated with serolimus. Uh, Boston Scientific quickly followed with two stents, Taxus Express and Taxus Liberté. These were also a stainless steel, but the drug was uh, Patly Taxil. Um, Medtronic have the Endeavor stent, which is cobalt chromium, and Zotorolimus is the drug. Um, Guidant and Abbott then had the Zions 5 and the Prime, cobalt chromium, and the Everolimus drug, and uh, Boston Scientific have since uh, launched the Promise, the Promise Element, and the Taxus Element, which are platinum chromium, and the drugs are Everolimus and Paclitaxel. Uh, Medtronic have the Resolute Integrity, which is cobalt chromium with a Zotorolimus drug, and uh, more recently, and I suppose it's just worth noting, uh, Boston Scientific have launched the Rebel Stent, which is platinum uh, chromium with no drug so going back to the bare metal stent and when I talk about these materials in later lectures uh, we might think about um, why platinum chromium uh, might be good enough on its own without a drug uh, in terms of the differences between the drugs so I'll talk about the differences between these materials in the next section but the differences in the drugs so serolimus Zotorolimus, Everolimus are all immune suppressing drugs. So they're suppressing the immune system uh, and basically telling the immune system not to see the stent as a foreign body and not to produce scar tissue, so reduce restenosis. Paclitaxel then is a chemotherapy drug. Its job is to kill cells, so it targets the scar formation in that manner. So that completes the section on stents and next we're going to talk about the different materials uh, that are used in the fabrication of these devices.